Welcome to the Predictable Revenue Podcast, where sales leaders teach you what's working for them so you can build it yourself. This episode of the Predictable Revenue Podcast is brought to you by our sales coaching and consulting services. Are you looking to create repeatable, scalable, and predictable revenue? We've helped thousands of companies grow their business with tailored expert advice backed by testing to ensure they establish the best practices that will work for them. Head over to bit.ly forward slash predictable coaching to learn more. All right, Christopher, thanks so much for joining us today and welcome to the show. Hey, Callan, I'm really happy to be here. Thanks for having me on today. I'm, I'm excited. I think anytime we can talk about sales conversations, specifically through the founder lens, uh, super helpful. Now, if you're not a founder and you're listening, this is going to be a good, for us, good conversation for you as well. But I think the the lens that Christopher works with clients or Christopher, you typically work with sort of founder led sellers. And so that's the lens that you're bringing to this conversation. So if you're an AE, if you're a sales manager, I still think there's going to be some really valuable learnings based on the pre conversations that Christopher and I have had, but just understand ahead of time, it's coming through the lens of founder led selling. Fair setup, Christopher? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. We're going to go, we're going to go deep and, and set up, like you said, um, a context and a framework to have more powerful sales conversations that create more clarity for anyone who's having a sales conversations. And you're right. I specifically work with founder sellers. Love it. One of my, and if you are a seller working with a founder, I think this first bit's going to be really valuable. One of, one of the things that if you've listened to the, the show for a while, you've probably heard me rant about is the first million dollars in sales is a function of product not sales. And that means, you know, when you're, when you're trying to figure out what product to build, whether it's a service, whether it's an actual piece of software, there is something you do with customer development interviews. And, you know, the word customer development interviews assume implies that they will eventually become customers. And to me, the conclusion of a set of customer development interviews and that sort of customer development process is the conversion of these hypothetical customers into actual customers that represent revenue. Thus, the first million is a product or an extension of your customer development exercise. And so you create all these hypotheses and then you validate them by asking for money. And what that typically looks like is beta users that eventually turn into paying users that eventually turn into companies that refer you to other companies that turn into more customers. That's generally the, how I see that sort of early founder kind of sales growth. I'd love to think, I'd love to throw it to Christopher and, you know, how, w when you think about that first million, are we sort of aligned? Do you see it differently? And like how and where found, should founders be involved in this process? Yeah, I think you really hit the nail on the head there, Colin. And it's, it's something that like we is on our schedule today to talk about, like when it makes sense to hire salespeople, but that, that like making sure that you have those customer development conversations so you can really dial in your market like who are your people what's their problem what's the solution you know what's your offer what's the result and really have that sorted out ahead of time plus kind of prototype whatever systems are required is the job of the founder right and early on, it's to keep cash flow coming into the the business so that there's money available to make the investments that are required. And there's no better person to do that for that first million than a founder. 100%. Yeah. 100%. I, I, there's so much like going zero to one of like what you need in terms of documentation, what you need in terms of feeding back the changes into the product, what you need in terms of like getting the engineering team to fix this bug or squash that bug or build something new. The, the way I think about it as a founder is like the, the more layers or the more people I add into the process, the more la layers of insulation I have from the actual customer. Mm -hmm. And in the early days, I don't want to be insulated from the customer at all. Yeah. So much of those early selling days are more about market research and crafting an offer and having those conversations than they are, like you said, of actually making sales. Like you, in, in those early days, you have to have money coming in. Like if you're bootstrapped, right? You have to have money coming in. If you're venture funded, you know, it, it may be a little bit of a different approach. And those conversations, you some of those are going to be actual marketing conversations where you're not showing up to sell, but 
that even your sales conversations should be marketing conversations on the front end of the the conversation. Totally. So if we transition into, we all agree that founders should be selling out to a million dollars and whether you're an AE or a sales manager or a founder kind of listening, um, what do you think, you know, I guess let's maybe, uh, let me frame this up a little bit differently. Let's say we've reached that million dollars in sales. Mm -hmm. You know, I was, I think at that, like I was saying, Colin, it depends on the nature of the business and, and what the business ultimately wants to do. I think generically, you're going to want as a founder, CEO, founder, seller, you're going to want to hire someone to take some of the lower dollar tasks and activities off your plate. And I actually think that that should start to happen way before the million dollar mark. But I would like continue to build your support team as a CEO or founder to pull some of those lower dollar tasks off your plate. And then this, the second hire, I would continue to build out your client delivery team and your service team. So as a founder, you can continue to focus on business development and driving revenue into the, into the business. Um, I even think, and you know, we, we may have a different perspective here, which is great, or we may be in alignment. I think, you know, onboarding, there's, there's some challenges to onboarding a sales team right? And bringing in when it's actually, it, it makes sense. And I think it's less a revenue threshold than it is kind of some of the foundation that's in place for the business and the growth that the business actually wants to achieve to, um, informs when you should actually start looking at bringing on a sales person. I know from the majority of founders and CEOs that I've talked with and that I've, I've had experience working with and even working in large organization, I've seen founder-led sales organizations up to $40 million. I've seen agencies with only founders and CEOs that are 10, 11, $12 million with only founder sellers. So like I know, and I've done the, the pro formas and the financials for those businesses, you know, and at the the deal sizes they sell, like you can get a lot of momentum and revenue from a founder led sales effort. So at that at that million dollar level, I think it's really about bringing in some people to help support what you're doing and freeing up your time, and then really bringing in some people who can help you on the delivery side of the business, so you can focus on strategy, building team, and and high level BD activities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I probably have, I I'm almost entirely in agreement with that. I mean, I think the, there, I, I might have some slight tweaks to, to what I would do, but I think overall the way I would think about it is almost exactly the same as you, uh, you are, uh, so first off I, I, I held onto sales till a million in revenue. Um, and then I, and then I started kind of, I actually hired an AE um, but I'd been, uh, my context is very different. I'd been an AE, I'd been a sales manager. I'd like training, onboarding an AE wasn't a new thing for me. Um, mm -hmm. And so that was a low risk activity in my books because I could ride shotgun and like, I knew what to look for. Um, and then I went on and I built the SDR team here. Um, and then, yeah, MR, uh, inbound team and then outbound team. Um, from a general founder approach, like I love what you said, building from the kind of lower order tasks and then moving up so that you can kind of move into like just the closing role, you know, like you get yourself an EA, maybe get yourself an SDR that can kind of book some of those meetings that can start reaching out to people that can handle the inbound, that can handle the outbound. And then as that SDR progresses, that's very well likely your next AE. Um, so that's kind of the, that's the trajectory. Dep again, it's the consultant answer. It depends on the speed at which you want to move and the type of business that you're selling and totally agree. I've seen, I didn't think it would be, uh, if I talked to you a week ago, I'd be like, no, nah, I, I haven't seen any companies that are $10 million or, up um, that are founder led selling, or, you know, I don't know the revenue range of this company, so I don't want to try and try and guess it, but I suspect the, based on their size, I suspect they're pretty large. Um, I've got Chris, uh, coming on from, uh, sales assembly, uh, two episodes. And uh, we were just talking about how they're, oh, they've got a fairly, I don't remember, I don't know the revenue number, but they're kind of 50 people and mm -hmm. uh, like pretty strong growth and it's mm -hmm. all that. And so that's yeah. kind of what we're talking about in a couple, uh, 
in a couple episodes. So I really like that. Uh, I really like that approach. And I think, especially now everybody's being asked to do more with less, you know, we're seeing a lot, um, the math for specialization, you know, still holds, but again, you're kind of like, we were seeing companies that had a $5,000 average deal size use SDRs. Like you've got to be hyper efficient, like hyper efficient to be a, to have a $5,000 deal size and have SDRs and like make it and for it to be profitable. profitable. And what we were seeing was a lot of companies that were leveraged on unprofitable growth. And so I think it's a thing that you want to consider is like you when and when and where is the right time and place to scale up your time. And what is the lift that your business is going to get out of it? It might be an unprofitable um, investment in the next three months um, if you just like it on, on the balance sheet. But if you're able to move up another level in the company as the CEO and say, okay, instead of working on sales, instead of working on lead gen, you know, I'm, I'm going to get 65% of the output if I hire this individual. Um, if I'm able to do that, what can I do with that increase in time? And so you might see like a small decrease and a certain metric, but that's okay because you're able to work on other things that are going to move the needle um, as a, it'll be a total net benefit. Apologies for the rant. <laughs> now, back to you. yeah, I think you have a, I think you have a clear understanding. I think it makes a lot of sense to start to consider building out a sales team and stepping out of, or tra not even stepping out of, because even like at the biggest companies, CEOs, founders are still doing high level visibility building. Like you may not be having sales conversations today, right? But like you're on this podcast. So like this podcast is a revenue generating activity for predictable revenue, right? So you're, you're going to tradition, but a founder is always going to be involved at some level in driving revenue for the business. I think in terms of like just stepping out of sales, you have you have like three, I think three challenges. I was thinking a little bit about this before the show, but you have kind of the the customer discussion <laughs> that we were talking about earlier. Like you really have to have your your market, your problem, your solution and result, like that offer and that that pr that fit like dialed in, like no salesperson is going to be over to overcome that unless like that stuff's dialed in. Right. And and the founder is the best person to to do that because they have status and experience and knowledge and they can sell stuff that's kind of not as built out or packaged up um, as, you know, an SDR or an AE could try to talk, talk about. The other challenge is where you just don't have the systems to consistently create conversations and have conversations, right? So if you're just like, you know, if you bring in a salesperson, you just tell them to go sell some shit, right? <laughs> Unless they're really good or have been sales in for a long time, if there's no enablement, they're going to have a pretty bad day. And then kind of the third leg on that stool is that the company has to be willing to grow enough to make bringing on a salesperson and paying them a base plus like commission so that it's profitable to bring that person in. And salespeople are expensive. And then, you know, a lot of the best strategies advocate for bringing in multiple salespeople so that you can have a team or you can kind of like A, B test those salespeople. And like with what on target earnings are for good salespeople and what the margins are for a lot of businesses you have to have a certain amount of growth, you know, a million, couple of million dollars in revenue to even start to consider um, bringing, bringing on and standing up a sales team that goes with that. And the, the other risk is that you just take your foot off the gas as a founder or CEO. You're like, oh, I get to hire salespeople. And then you take your foot off the gas while you're trying to establish a sales organization for your business, which can be a, I mean, you know, a multiple year <laughs> endeavor to get that thing working <laughs> and stood up, you know, yeah, I know people want to do it in six months, but the, the reality is like working with our clients and what I've seen and talking with other people, it's a 12 month, two year type of commitment to really get that going well. So. Oh, totally. Yeah. yeah. I work with so many companies that want to fire up some outbound uh, and they they come and they're like, Hey, we've been six months and we're not profitable yet. It's like, yeah. Yeah. So they're like, well, right. we're not profitable yet. It's like, okay, but who said you were going to be profitable? Oh, well, I plotted out here and here. And it's like, your math is wrong. Like mm -hmm. it, these things take time. Um, yeah. And like 
you can get people to reply to an email. You can get them to pick up the phone. You can get them to take a meeting, but you can't influence when or not, when they are going to be ready to make a purchase decision. Mm -hmm. And just statistically, there's only a certain number of people that are going to be ready to, to buy right now. And so mm -hmm. these things take time. Customers take a while to develop, to realize that, hey, this is going to be a great fit. And I think one of the sneaky benefits of Outbound that most people don't realize because they don't go, do a great job of nurturing. Uh, and this is probably true for, I, I'd say this is true for salespeople. It certainly was for me as a salesperson when I was first figuring it out, uh, is that you most don't have a system in place to work those nurtures mm -hmm. long-term to actually get the value. You know, you might get people coming back oh, in 12 months or 18 months, or even like we get tons of old customers coming back to us. They're like, Hey, we, you know, we worked with you for six months. And then, you know, six months later, a bunch of deals closed. We're like, mm -hmm. they're like, okay, now we're back. And they're like, great. And then they'll stay for a very long time. Um, but I think, you know, to your point, it does take time. The, uh, I want you to talk about, you know, tell me a little about these systems. Cause I totally agree. There's so much of this is a systems game. Um, what are the core systems and how do you think about sales systems from a, yeah. How do you think about sales systems? Yeah. So when I think about building a business that can profitably make sales and create the conversations it needs and, and have those conversations, I think of a foundation of sales ready people and sales ready systems. So like people is the first system. And then mm -hmm. I'll share some of the other systems, but those two systems, people or and systems form the foundation of what I call a sales ready organization, Colin. And the sales ready organization framework creates clarity on what to do in a structured way to actually do it. So what's so important about having a framework for wrapping your revenue generating activities around is it prevents you from building and creating things that actually don't lead to driving revenue, which actually creates a, a ton of waste in your process. You know, one of the ways that I help my clients add revenue with less sales work is I go and I look at their systems, most of which they're not using. And then the ones they're using, they're just not using effectively. And I'm like, that's just like clean all that shit out and stop doing a lot of this. And then the second way to help clients is just to actually do some of the work for them. But the by far... The way to eliminate waste is just to look at things that have cluttered up their business over the years and years of working with, you know, who <laughs> all their clients, all their employees, and all all kind of the the weight of all that, which isn't actually supporting the business. It's not the right foundation for where that business is going. So, you know, when I think of those systems, there's really five core systems to being a sales ready organization. It's your mindset right? It's your leadership systems. So, you know, what do you, you actually want? What are your goals? How are you reporting on that? It's your marketing systems. So really, how are you creating conversations? It's your sales systems. And then it's your project management systems. So, and that's just on, I would just say on the revenue side, I don't really touch like client delivery, but it's, you know, for, for revenue, for adding revenue, it's mindset, leadership, marketing, sales, and project management. People typically miss mindset because they think it's too woo-woo or spiritual, right? They don't really connect that in as a revenue generating activity, especially if they've never worked with someone in that capacity. But especially in sales, because we have so many stories around strangers and money, like mindset is super important um, for salespeople in particular. So having some coaching there is super important. And then they always miss project management. Like, you know, there's like, they don't view, it depends on business level maturity or entrepreneurial maturity, but they don't view sales as like an ongoing project or like they'll think they'll be like, Hey, I set up my CRM where CRM or revenue ops is something you need to do all the time and needs to be actively improved and managed all the time. Um, yeah, so those those are kind of the core sales ready organization systems, and that's what I work with my clients on is really getting those systems in place, understanding you know what you're doing well, what you're not doing so well, and kind of what's missing completely. Because sometimes it's just like a small thing that's missing, but if you don't have that framework, that checklist to understand what needs to be put in place, 
you know, it's like a race car, man. Like if the race car doesn't have a steering wheel or a gas tank, you're going to have a pretty bad day as a, as a race car driver. So. Yeah. You'll be stagnant. <laughs> yeah. You'll be, you'll have like sweet, sweet engine tires, turbo, all this stuff. But since sales is a system of systems, if one part of it is missing, the whole, the whole thing kind of doesn't work. I totally agree. Um, yeah, hundred percent agree. I'm, trying not to launch into my systems and all that. But I think yeah. one thing I'll add is like, we, I see it the very same way. I see sales as a chain link system. And if you are doing a poor job at one of the links in the system, it can multiply the results of the whole by zero. Um, yeah. Not necessarily always zero, but it can. Uh, yeah. So strongly, strongly agree. I think any, uh, let, me, go no, go let me just add on one thing there. I think, you know, I'm, I'm sure... I know you're great at helping your clients add revenue. Um, and I'm sure you have a great process and great, great systems. And I think, I think more, more important than the particular framework or process that you use is that you just have a process that you're improving and you're, you're, you're working on in a consistent fashion. Regardless of what process or framework you use, what I see a lot is people start building out their tools before understanding understanding their strategy and their process. So they'll they'll set up their CRM. They'll be like, "I need enablement. I need these automations. I need a website. I need a podcast. I need to write a book. Like I need to do all the, and all of these things." But then none of those things they actually build out connect into a marketing process or a sales process. Right. So then when I walk in and I assess organizations, I see hundreds of documents and tools that they've spent hours and hours and tens of thousands of dollars on or hundreds of thousands of dollars on that they're not using anymore. And that actually aren't white papers, case studies, email, like all that stuff. So it's much better to start with your process and be like, you know, we have a three conversation workflow. And on this first conversation, I need a script and a follow up email to send and then build the tools to support that process and hang that stuff on the process. So that's, I see that all the time and that's a huge mistake to do it that way. Totally. One of my early mentors and he wasn't even in sales. He was a technology person. His process or his like high level that he always hammered into me was people, then process, then technology. That's it. You need to have the right people yeah. to do the work. Then you need the right process to enable the people, and then you need the yep. right technology to enable the process, and that's, that's it. how it stitches together. And if you don't do that, if you start with the technology, then you got the you got your CRM driving the bus, and like yeah, you know, Salesforce is good and all, HubSpot's good and all, but if you don't you if you let the tool use you, you're not gonna you don't get it robs you of the opportunity to think about and do the hard work of the process work, which yeah. is the sitting down with a blank Google Doc and saying what the hell have I been doing on these sales calls? Yeah. I'd right? like to really sit and think and reflect. And I totally empathize with salespeople or sorry, with founders that are in a sales role, because I would much rather be playing with a cool tool than sitting mm. staring at a blank Google doc going, what the hell did I do on that last sales call? Okay. What about that one? And what's, what's the through line? That's really hard, challenging mental work mm. to kind of put all that together. Um, and it's much more fun to play with a tool. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But don't do it. This is a note to Colin in the future. Don't do don't it. Don't do it. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> do the process work first. Now do the process work first. You'll have a much and it's it's boring, tedious work. You know, it's hard to write. You know, I don't think any founder or CEO started their business to write SOPs, right? Or or think no. through that those workflows. But like I've seen I've worked with so many founders and you know um, firms on CR CRMs and like, they're just, they're an absolutely mess and they're not enabling the business. And even though they have cool automations and plenty of outsourced technology and are all integrated, they're actually not leading to, or helping that business create conversations or have sales conversations. So hundred <laughs> percent. I, I do want to get into sales conversations because one of the interesting pieces that we talked about in the pre-interview was the sort of core components of a sales conversation. I think this is, as a founder, it, not coming from sales, this is probably one of the hardest things to figure out. If you're, because if, if I'm in the role of a founder who just built the product or is in the process of building a product, I want to show up and be like, look at the stuff that I built. 
And even when I was a founder, I come from sales. I spent 10, 11 years selling before I did this, and I still did that. Because you're so excited. It's like when you have a newborn, you're like, look at my cute yes. baby. You're like, that thing is hideous. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's kind of ugly, but <laughs> yeah. And I love the, the, good, the good sales father's like, do you want to see a picture of my kids? And you can tell somebody's like, oh yeah, I'll show you some of mine. Or like, nah, I don't want to see your frog. I don't care. Yep. And I think that's the right. kind of analogy. And so I'd love to understand love that. your take on the sort of core components of a sales conversation. Yeah. Well, first there's, um, I mean, we'll get into like the tactics of an actual sales conversation, but I think you hit the nail on the head there. Like it's a shift around what the purpose of a sales conversation actually is. And it's not, and I think a lot of this comes from like this, like this learned pitch cult culture where we learn to like create something and then pitch it out there, which is not how B2B businesses actually sell and it's that takes some work like internally to make that that shift because humans are naturally eye centric and you've spent all that time having that baby or making that making that product right and you want you think it's awesome and it is just for some people but not for everybody and you need to start to realize that sales has nothing to do with you as the seller right and it's shifting whether you call it you know we centric or you centric or you you call it sales buyer synonymous centric. with love, buyer centric, like I think, or showing up in service instead of get like get energy. You're not there to get something as a sales. You're not even there to make a sale, right? Like a goal is to make sales, but not with that particular p particular person. You know, I had a mentor say to me, you know, that sales isn't something that you do to someone. Sales is something that you do for someone, and it's really a a place of service. And that is like that truth of sales synonymous with love. And I think if you show up with that intention, it'll really, with the, and the intention I mean is just to help the other person. A sales conversation is just about helping the other person. And if you help people, they'll buy, you know? Um, so that, and that shift is the first shift, which is so hard for new you have two you have two problems going on with most sales conversation is one the founder loves their product and they just want to talk about their product and two people think early sales people want to make a sale they want to get money you need to get that money right and those two things are are killer for those lead to really bad sales conversations so in I think that second piece comes from a lot of the early sales books where it's like, this is how you convince somebody to buy, That's right? It. Like, I think, I think there was a period like in the nineties and early aughts where like, there were so many books on like NLP and so many books on, you know, this is how you do the yes ladder. And this is how you get them to say yes. And it's like, yeah. I, I grew up reading those and I was like, this doesn't feel right. Cause the mm -hmm. first book I ever read was Miller Hyman, new strategic selling. Mm -hmm. And it talks about how to understand your buyer. And, and if I'm like, I 100% agree. This is the buyer's journey. We are just guides. And the role of the salesperson is to understand the problem. Be like, hey, talk to me about your problem. I understand the problem we understand really, that we solve really well. Let's see if your problem looks like that shape. And if it does, cool. And if there's a couple rough edges, then I'll be like, hey, this is where it's not going to be as good. That's where it's not going to be as good. But the moment that I think it like really helped visualize it for me I was reading a non-sales book, Nancy Duarte's Resonate, and she was talking about presentations. And the role of the presenter is not the hero, is not the hero. It's, it, they were talking about the hero's journey. Yeah. The role of the presenter is not the hero. And if we take the Star Wars analogy, you are not Luke Skywalker. Mm -hmm. You are Yoda, an important character, but you're hardly in the movie. The whole movie is about Luke. The whole buying journey is about the buyer. You're just mm -hmm. this little tiny green person. So like... Mm -hmm. Ask a couple of questions in a very strange backward way and then shut up and let yep. the movie focus on the hero. That's it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think that's the first shift is like, is really reframing what you think about a sales conversation. And I'll, I'll share with the, the listeners and with you a quick way to do that. And then we can get into the actual structure of a sales conversation. But no matter whether I'm getting on this podcast or I'm having a sales conversation or I'm giving a a speech, I always 
for myself and I teach all my clients this is to do three things is to get clear on their positive intention, right? To set a goal for that conversation and to have a key move. So in a sales conversation, it looks like this. So my positive intention for the majority of my sales conversations is to help the other person. My goal is to make sales in general. Like I have sales conversations to make sales in my business. And my key move, it's like the one thing I'm committed to. It's either usually to tell a story or to schedule the next conversation, right? So I, I would use that, like just take five minutes before you get on that call to get clear on your positive intention, get clear on what's your actual goal, meaning what is the outcome you're hoping to achieve from this conversation, which is about you. And then like, what's the one thing, what's your key move on that conversation? I think if you go, if you do those three things, you know, and you show up in service, you're going to have a really great conversation, mm. even if you don't have the best script or don't know the right questions to ask. <laughs> so, totally. I mean, I think any day you're asking questions about the pain that and the things that they're struggling with, you 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 can't start. There, there's no wrong way to start a conversation when you're talking about the user or the the potential buyer and their pain and their struggles. Yeah. So I hinted at that that sales conversations aren't about making a sale. So the question might be, what are sales conversations actually about, right? I'm so the- Just running this podcast for me. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm the Yoda of this podcast. <laughs> you're the star, I'm the Yoda. Or maybe you're supposed to be the Yoda, I don't I know. I'm supposed to be the Yoda. I might've been, I might have oh, been too much Luke. <laughs> maybe you're Luke Skywalker, who knows? Um, <laughs> I think sales conversations are about creating clarity for the buyer really around what it is that they want, right? So what is the, what's the outcome or goal? So it's really about creating clarity and then um, a yes or no on if they want what they say they want. So in a, in a sales conversation, you're trying to really create that clarity. Well, you're trying to create that clarity around what that person wants, right? And you do that by asking questions about that and then understanding the issues or the problems about what's preventing them from having what it is they, they want, okay? And, you know, um, what you're really looking there for as the salesperson is fit. You're going, can can I or can my company help that person have what they want, whether that's to solve a problem or achieve an aspiration is kind of how those two frame up. And like, is that something my company does, helps people do that? Um, and are the challenges and problems that they're experiencing something that we're equipped to help guide them or move them through? So that so that's fit. And then if there's fit, like that's when that's when you can, you know, see if that person is really committed into having what they say they want and help them tap into their urgency. And there's some questions that I'm sure you know and that, you know, I work with my my clients on, but it's really like, is that person do they urgently want to solve that because there's some type of impact or or consequences like how the sales books talk about it? Because if there's no urgency, that person's never going to buy and you can just end the call and pop off the call. Like that's where you're like, there's no urgency. And then because there's no urgency, that person's not going to be in a yes to change because change and growth is difficult and they're going to be in a no. And so now you have clarity on what that person wants. And then the last piece of clarity is like, is that person a yes or a no to buy from buy from you? And it's actually like a really simple conversation um and you know if you can help people get clear on what they want and what their problems are and you can present a solution that helps them do that you can you can have really nice helpful conversations and you're not trying to help that person Colin you're not trying to help that person only after this is this is why my positive intention is to help right? My positive intention isn't to sell them something that helps them. It's literally to help them buy that conversation. The gift in a sales conversation is that the conversation itself is helpful. 
and you demonstrate expertise, you get you achieve no like and trust, you deliver value and rapport, not by handing you a white paper and giving you something by knowing, but by actually knowing how to have a sales conversation that helps that person look at what it is they really want and what problems are really going on. And if you can develop a skill around having that that sales conversation, um, you're going to help a lot of people and you're going to make a lot of money in the in the process. Totally. Can, mind if I add some color to this? Cause I, yeah. Go. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> the, the way I think about it, because I've seen, I've been in these calls as a founder, as a salesperson, and... I've had, I've had these moments on the calls where they've got this like, oh, moment. And it's the questions. I think the value that we bring as sellers is we understand the problem space, right? The customer understands their business the best. We understand the problem space the best. And I think the, the most helpful, when I think back, the most helpful I've been to buyers that didn't buy were the questions that I asked helped them shape and understand the true size and scope of the problem that they were dealing with. And when you really do that, you uncover things. You're like, okay, well, see what you're trying to do over here. That might not be a fit, a perfect fit for what we do because our product is shaped like this and your problem is shaped like this. And that's okay, right? But it was the question. So if you're listening, you're like, well, how do I actually do this? Because I'm just trying to sell them something. It's no in your problem exploration, you know the problem space really well. You know how other people have solved this. You know where the rough edges are going to be, and you know what you do really, really well. And by asking those questions, you help bring these issues to light. And that's what I've seen is the impact of, it's not the questions, me, me being the challenger and the challenger sale and be like, you should do it this way. You should do it that way. That did not work at all for me. That would, to me, that shut down the conversations. It's the asking the questions to under to to really deep to get to a deep level of understanding with the customers. They kind of have these like oh moments. Ah, I get it. Right. Okay. I didn't see that. I didn't know that. If you're hearing things like that, you're actually genuinely helping people understand mm -hmm. the problem. Even if they don't move forward with you, you're still being helpful. Yeah, and that's the help is like asking, knowing which questions to ask, and the sequence of when to ask those questions is is what's helpful and is really where the value is in a in a sales conversation so yeah it's super cool i love the idea of like you know all of those sales books you know that that have come out you know whatever whatever they are you know they all have beneficial things in them but the sequencing what, what where people get it wrong is like the sequencing of where to use those questions or where to um when to do that process so yeah so maybe we'll cut some of the white space we'll, let's just keep going um yeah. how do we come up with those questions right if we're in the sales conversation or if somebody's sitting here thinking okay well i typically start by just showing them a demo of the product and a product tool tour and mm -hmm. we know this is not the way that you want to start the conversation so if somebody's listening how do you come up with, how do you work with a client and come up with these conversations or these questions? I think there's two, I think there's kind of two parts you're checking for, which is just clarity on what they want and what their issue is. Right. And then, um, you have some, some logistical questions, which you may or may not need to include, like in particular, like, you know, and they, they're more important for larger B2B deals right? It depends on, on, but it may be like, who else, who else is involved in this decision, right? Am I selling into a buying committee or are you, you know, am I having a, a one-on-one -on -one with a, a founder CEO of a smaller, who's like in charge of everything, you know, you may, there may be a parameter question, like what are the success criteria for this project, which is for a larger deal, you might want to get really dialed in, but for, um, for most sales conversations, you know, those logistical parameter type questions mm -hmm. don't, don't come up. Um, and I don't actually think are as important as like, just literally asking the person what it is that they want. Like, what is the outcome that they're hoping to achieve and really hanging, hanging in that question. And then from there, just like really understanding like what's preventing them from 
achieving that? Like, what are the issues, right? Mm. And I think just with those two questions, you can have a really beautiful conversation, right? It's literally just those two questions. And you have to be willing to like really stay in those questions as a human and like um, unpack those and give them some space to breathe. Um, the And then from there, it's like just like trying to understand, you know, a question around understanding if this is important to them or if they're urgent to solve this, right? And there's some ways ways to do that. And then just asking, you know, is this something, you know, are they committed? Are they willing to, to solving, to solving that, to having to like, do they really want what they say they, they want? Um, and if all of those, you know, that right there is a real, a real gift. And if all of that is in alignment, you know, then, and you can help them have what they want, then that's when you can move into talking about, you know, a solution or a product. But I think, you know, if you lead with a demo or a, or a product, it's like, you're just pitching at that point. Right. And that, that's a really challenging, I don't think there's any, and you're also, you're also, there's a bit of a disservice when that happens because you're kind of leaving the buyer to, you're saying, Hey, here's some shit. <laughs> here's some stuff. Apologies. That's okay. Here's, here's some stuff. Um, I, I, I apologize not for the language, but for diminishing how hard and what people actually work on. Um, but here's some stuff because that's how the buyer views it. And then assuming that they're the expert that can correctly evaluate whether that thing will solve their their problem, right? Instead of you instead of you being that 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 guide or that, that expert to understand actually what's going on because, and then advising them on what's required to have their, have the result that they're looking for. You know, like I've worked with a hundred plus sales organizations as, as a consultant at this point, right. And stood up, done many more CRM implementations than that. And, you know, sold for and developed processes and systems for multiple fortune 500 companies. And I'm not saying like these founders aren't experienced or able to do that, or your buyers aren't experienced in what they do because they understand the business so well to your point, but in terms of the problem space and the solutions and what the market is doing and what's working and not working, you're really in the expert, the expert role there. So you need to show up with that expertise with those those good questions. So does that, does that help? hundred percent helps. Yeah. yeah. I think it's, it's always, there's so many different perspectives. And I think the, the trap to, that you can fall into as a, as a founder, um, especially when not coming from sales is you read a blog post that says band or medic. I talk about medic or med pick all the time and I love it. And so yeah. if, you're, uh, if you're a non-sales founder and you're coming into a call and you're thinking, bam, 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 yeah. budget of authority, right. need time, like budget time. authority, need time, like, yeah. and then you're sitting there and they're like talking about the thing and you're like, okay, but what's your budget for this? You're like, whoa, whoa, right. whoa, 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 you don't even know what my pain is. Like, why you, why you yeah. ask for a credit card, you know? Yeah. And my, one of my favorite things to do is ask for it. They're like, so do you have any questions? I'm like, yeah, what's your credit card number? Like, I make that joke all the time. It still makes me laugh. Yeah, um, like mm -hmm. on and I before I was a founder, I would make that joke, and it's so silly and it's so dumb, um, but like, it's so easy to get into budget authority need timeline and just wanting to answer those questions. And the buyer's like, "Hey, are you just taking off boxes?" Yeah. Right. And so I love that you're you're encouraging people to start with the pain, and I think a piece to if if you're listening, a piece to maybe double click on is the is what you said about holding space for the problem this is slowing down and not doing what I've been doing all episode and just jumping in all the time. And I'm getting excited and I want to add on. That is not the right way to, not a great way to run a podcast, not a great way to run a sales conversation. You know, I'm doing this because I'm excited. The buyer is doing this because they're trying to solve a problem and we're trying to understand the size and the shape of that problem. And so I think that was one thing I also struggled with was getting away from bam, 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 and getting into, help me understand the, pro the problem and like, 
uh, the entire edges, uh, like all edges of the problem, size, shape, dimensions in the 3D before I start talking about my solution. Yeah. And I, I, I love that. And I, I do want to really emphasize the gift in a sales conversation. The problems are important, but what the person wants is way more important, right? So suspending some time really, you know, because, you know, from a very young age, we're not given space as children to want what we want. And we're actually, you know, no one actually asks you very rarely, like what it is that you, what is it, what it is that you really want, right? And so when you can talk about that, the problems can be solved. Like they're solvable, right? Like chat GPT or Google can solve those for you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> not a hundred percent yet, but like, but what people actually really want, what's really in their heart, like what's really going on. You know, if you can talk about that stuff and hold space for, for that and, and then follow that on with a good, um, analysis or inquiry into, you know, the problem that th those two things together are that sales gold right there. That's con just conversation gold in general. So, yeah, I t totally agree. The, the last kind of th couple of things I wanted to talk, touch on, on this conversation was the, the urgency and then willingness to change. Um, when you're talking about urgency, you know, it's the T in timing, right? So mm -hmm. how are you asking about urgency without, without just saying, Hey, like, are you ready to buy now? Like, how do you yeah. bring that up? I don't know. I think, I think each person can find their own questions, but you can ask things like, um, why now? What about this is driving you crazy, right? What happens if this doesn't change? What's it worth to you to make this change? Right. Um, mm -hmm. You can, you know, I, I don't know, like you can ask someone like, why is this urgent? Like, is this urgent for you? <laughs> right. And some people like find that question a little too direct and it, it may, their ego may be too involved to like actually answer that. But I find like just going like, Hey, is this actually urgent for you? Because if it's not, you're never, you're just never going to buy you know, and I coach like part of that's because I coach on mindset. So like I can be a little bit more, I find myself able to like be more direct about that and just go like, you know, is this actually urgent for you and talk about why if it's not urgent, it doesn't matter what my solution is. They're just, you're just never going to buy because you're not going to want to go through the change, the change and growth process to have what it is that you, you want. So, but those are questions like, you know, why is this important? What's driving you crazy? What happens if this doesn't change, right? What are the consequences? You know, if you don't solve this, make this change, realize this result, you know, so does that help? Totally. And that does that tend to lead into like willingness to change or is that? Do you yeah, I think, I think, questions? no, I think willingness to change is kind of its own own piece. And that's really where you want to just understand if someone's committed to doing the work. And I think that's not just for making the sale, but like if you're selling, you know, a, whatever you're selling, whether it's a CRM implementation or a 12 month consulting engagement, right? Like you really want to know that that person's going to hang in there and do the work and that they're available to do, to do the work. So it's not only for them, like that they really want to do it, but like, if you want to lose weight, you got to change your eating habits and go to the gym more. Like there's a lot of activity and work there. And so you want, you want to make sure that that person really is committed to that, which it actually will help you, make the sale because they actually want what they say they want but it also helps you understand that you're you have a client that's gonna create the result because it's way more fun when your clients <laughs> realize the result and use your services to create the result that they that they're going for than you know not being willing to do do the work so that's kind of the la that's the last piece there it can look like, are you ready, willing, and able to 
work together now. Mm -hmm. Right. Something like that. I, I think you, a lot of this has been implied, but I just wanted to, to hold up a mirror here. It sounds like these. this is a sequential conversation. You have to start with clarity on the outcome, and then you end with willingness to change and grow. Is that That's fair? Right? That's fair. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Cool. It doesn't. Ha it doesn't happen the other way around. So, all and I want to mention, like with the Bant, the Bant questions, or you know, those are parameters. Like those are the, like the param. Those are things that that are less important because all of those things are solvable if the person really wants what they say they want. Those are just resource issues, and like those can be solved, whether it's timing or money or you know authority or any of those those things. So the I think the need is the most important question in the, in the band, the band stuff. So, but totally. yeah, they're sequential. Love that. Yeah, I, I'm a big fan. Need or whatever you want to call it, and like how they yeah. quantify that need and the impact on the business, how they measure it. Favorite question. That's usually it. always where I start. Yeah, start there. Like what and what do you want? Just like yeah. If your listeners take anything away from this podcast, it's like. Use the framework of positive intention, goal, and key move. And your first question should be, what is it that you want? You know, or totally. yeah. you could also ask, like, why are we having this conversation? That's another way to ask that question. Or what are you hoping to get out, out of this conversation? So love that. Yeah. And help me understand the impact that you've seen this have, like adding this kind of process to a conversation, adding this kind of process to um, an organization on a company. Yeah, particularly when it comes to the impact. I mean, tactically, it's like, you know, it's higher close rates, way less time wasted. I think, you know, it's more revenue in the business. Um, I also think there's a lot of self-confidence. Like when I recommend, you know, too, that you like script that out, that you pre-write your conversations so like those questions are the heart of your conversations, but I think actually scripting out or writing like a sales conversation should be a designed conversation. It's a very particular conversation. You good? Yeah. 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 We'll keep going. So a sales conversation is a very like, it's a very formal conversation held mm -hmm. as informally and conversationally as you can, <laughs> as you can do. Right. But you should definitely design it. And when you do that, like I said, you're going to have higher close rates. You're going to not waste your time. You're not going to waste your buyer's time. You're going to show up more authentically and not try to get anything, you know, in terms of like helping founder sellers with this, like, I know by improving your sales conversations and being sales ready, like founders can add a half million to a million dollars in revenue, like in six months, like very, very quickly. And more than that, depending on the the service offering and the size of the the business, so that's what I would say the the main impact is. It's just confidence. It's like having a tool there. It's a skill. Um, that was the other thing about salespeople. Like salespeople don't work out because they just don't have the skill around ha knowing how to have a sales conversation. And once you learn that as a founder yourself, how to really have those sales conversations, then you can teach that to your sales people and scale your, your team. Exactly. Yeah. And totally. And if <laughs> Neil, <laughs> and, but, um, if you are a founder, like working these questions out for yourself, as opposed to being insulated from the person who's having these conversations for the first time is probably one of the best things you can do for building out that process. Yeah. yeah. And it creates a lot. It, the The other benefit is it helps the buyer because most buyers don't know know how to buy, right? They you sell every day, but buyers only buy. You know, they don't they buy much less frequently than you sell. So you have way more knowledge about helping people buy than buyers know about buy about buying. So it actually, you know, it's of service to understand how to have a sales conversation and have a series of really good questions to ask that help that are helpful for people. 
totally agree. As you can see, I'm being invaded by a sick kiddo who's taken up my time. I've really yeah. enjoyed having you on the podcast, Christopher. If people are looking to get in touch with you, what's the best way for them to reach out? Yeah. So if you're a founder seller looking to add more revenue with less sales work, um, reach out to me. It's very likely that I can help you. The best way to do that is to um, send me an email at Christopher at ChristopherFlipiak.com. Uh, find me on LinkedIn. I'm fairly active there as Christopher Filippiak. And um, my website is ChristopherFlipiak.com. There's a really nice um, set of data there that makes a case for founder sellers and kind of can answer some questions on, you know, when to hang with founder seller only or when to start to transition to to sales um to build like to scale your sales team so those three ways email address website linkedin beautiful i've uh, thrown a link to your uh, i pulled apart the email i put put an at in there but check the show notes for christopher's uh email address and obviously domains in there as well cool really enjoyed this conversation i knew it was going to be a, a blast with you and i hope you're your listeners find it find it valuable and it can have some really great sales conversations starting today. Love it. Christopher, thank you so much for coming on the show. You're so welcome. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next week.